we're still looking at 2.5 to 2.8, maybe as high as 3.2 degrees. And that's if countries have done absolutely everything they said. So the gap's pretty big, and we have to start thinking about this ratcheting up of which the global stock take is a huge part. Welcome to the Challenging Climate Podcast, where we discuss the big ideas and controversies in climate change with leading experts. I'm Jesse Reynolds, an environmental policy specialist. And I'm Pete Irvin, a climate scientist. The climate is changing. Join us as we try to keep up. In this episode, our guest is Jennifer Allen, who is a strategic advisor and team leader with Earth Negotiations Bulletin, the de facto record of global environmental negotiations. In that capacity, she has attended roughly 40 UN conferences where states negotiate the rules of global climate governance. Jen is also a senior lecturer at Cardiff University, where her research explores environmental and social movements and how global rules are made and remade. Her recent work focuses on the politics of sustainable post-COVID recoveries, including green stimulus packages in the UK and the emergence of the green recovery norm globally. Well, Jen, welcome to Challenging Climate. Thank you very much. When this episode airs, we'll be in the run-up to COP28, which will be running 30th November to 12th December 2023 in United Arab Emirates. So to start off, what is a climate COP? What does COP stand for? Well, I mean, there's the nerdy version and then probably the real version. So COP is the conference of the parties serving as the meeting of the parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Really what it means is COP is a giant conference and it has a lot of parts. So probably the part that gets the most attention is the negotiations because we have the Convention on Climate Change, we have the Kyoto Protocol, and most importantly, we have the Paris Agreement. And so there's a lot of decisions made around those three treaties and of a whole bunch of other decisions. But now COP has grown. So biggest event that the United Nations hosts every year. We're expecting 70,000 people potentially in the UAE this year. So it's a giant event. So in, there's the negotiations, there are statements by world leaders, there's activism by civil society, there's huge exhibition spaces where other organizations, whether they're companies or the World Health Organization, will showcase what they're doing. It's really just a giant, giant meeting now. So what gets decided there? What doesn't get decided there? Oh, that's a huge question, but that's okay. We'll break it up. So in terms of what gets decided, a lot of it is about the Paris Agreement these days. So what countries are doing to implement the Paris Agreement? And there's been this push recently by some countries to say, well, actually, we need to move a little bit further than the Paris Agreement. We need to talk about ramping up action before 2030. We need to talk about phasing down all fossil fuels. But other countries, like developing countries, maybe China, India, that have large economies, are saying, well, wait a minute, we agreed to a Paris Agreement system. The Paris Agreement only started in 2020, so let's stick to that system first before we start moving beyond it. And that's kind of the tension that runs through a lot of the negotiations these days. In terms of what doesn't get decided, there's a lot of issues that really have always been stuck. So if you think about international aviation and international shipping emissions, it's about 2% of global emissions, so a fair amount. There's never been a decision on that. So the UN climate change process has been absolutely silent on it. The Paris Agreement's been silent on it. There really hasn't been much on that specific issue. So there are issues that fall through the cracks of the global process. And there's issues that are seen to be a bit too, shall we say, prescriptive for what countries should do specifically. So there won't be any decisions where it says this country needs to do exactly this action. It's more about helping countries and being more transparent with countries about what they should be doing. So what are the decisions that are made? And who makes them? And are they legally binding? So decisions are made by consensus, which has been taken to mean that all 195 countries, 195 plus really, all those countries agree to every word. So it's slow. I've been in negotiations that went about five, six hours because of a semicolon, because you can read a sentence differently with a semicolon versus a comma. 
And that changes the legal interpretation. And also it's maybe why lawyers need a break sometimes. Just let us get on with it. But all these things matter. So it can be very, very slow because it's governments taking decisions. In terms of legally binding, it's a really tricky question. So it's a bunch of what lawyers might call soft law. So it's nobody's going to take you to a court over this, but really it's about countries saying that they all agree to a certain set of actions that should happen in the future. And there may not be repercussions for all of them, but there's a mutual expectation of what would happen. So if you look at the Paris Agreement, there's only two things in the Paris Agreement that are, strictly speaking, legally binding, where a country could get in some trouble. One is to have a pledge, a nationally determined contribution, NDC. The contents of it, though, are not legally binding, but one is just to have one and keep it up to date. And then the other one is to submit a national report every two years. That's, those are the only two things in the Paris Agreement that are completely legally binding. Otherwise, it's a lot of kind of hoping and should and encouraging and things like that. So you've been working with the Earth Negotiations Bulletin for some time. What does this organization and what do you do at COPS? Sure. So the ENB has been around since, gosh, it's over 30 years now. And ENB covers almost every international environmental negotiation process. So it is a treasure trove of who said what in global negotiations going back decades. So what we do is every day we write a report of what were the main issues talked about, who said what, or were the sticking points or areas of agreement, and what do you expect to see tomorrow? And so we publish that every day. It's publicly accessible. Anyone from around the world could read it. We usually try to translate into at least French and Spanish hopefully other languages, just to increase transparency because these global processes are complicated. They're far away. Like you said, we're in the UAE this year. Not everyone can make it to Dubai in December. And they are very jargon heavy. So what we try to do is provide a summary for sort of the negotiators and the keeners, and then also maybe a bit of a broader assessment of what happened that day for people that are interested. So it's really trying to kind of provide that transparency. It also provides a lot of equity because a lot of developing countries are simply outmatched. On any given hour of a negotiation in, at a climate COP, there might be eight topics being talked about in parallel rooms. So if you're from a small state that maybe only has four people, you have to make some pretty tough choices of what you're going to pay attention to. So we've also found that negotiators will read our reports just to catch up on what they missed out. So it's hopefully a tool that helps. But yeah, we scurry around and write notes and write up these reports to a very, very strict deadline and word count. Our rule is we don't leave the building until it's published. So you can imagine how cranky we get when they start online negotiations. We'll turn our attention back to cops in general later on, but I'd like to dive into some of the issues which are on the agenda for COP28, which starts later this month. Uh, and we'll do through four or five or six of these issues, depending on how much time we have. The first is the global stock take. And to have a bit of a background there, I'll say that the Paris Agreement operates in a, in a five-year cycle in which countries are expected to announce their ambition, their goals, and alternating with that is an assessment of how they're doing. Can you say some more about the global stock take? This will be the first stock take. So I'm curious, what's it going to be? What form will it take? Who's producing it? Jen? Well, those are all questions that are still to be decided which is not a great sign when we are a few weeks away from when this is supposed to happen. So yes, this is the first global stock take. And the, the goal of the global stock take is to help countries bring forward more ambitious and more targeted pledges when they get to that next set of the cycle that you described. So it's supposed to give us a good snapshot Countries were very specific when they negotiated this, that the stock take would be an aggregate look of how all countries are doing. So there's no naming and shaming here. There's no look at what individual countries have done. They were very, very clear when this was negotiated that it was supposed to be in aggregate. 
So that's one thing to keep in mind as we talk about what this thing is going to be. So for the last year and a half, there's been the technical phase of the global stock take, where there's been a series of roundtables and workshops and meetings and all sorts of formats and a series of written inputs from a lot of different bodies, a lot are under the UN process about what they've been doing in various areas. And so now it's come together into a giant report, which is the outcome of the technical phase. So what's supposed to happen at this COP is the political phase. Now, this is where all the question marks are, because it's not clear yet how all of these inputs from all of these different groups are supposed to be put together into one political outcome. It's not clear what the political outcome will be, because the Paris Agreement is silent on what that is. So it, nobody really knows, is this a declaration? Is this some sort of decision? Is this a thank you very much for the report? We'll see you in a couple of years. Is it an identification of some key areas for future action? I mean, it's really unknown at this point exactly what's supposed to happen. And countries so far have only published their views on what it should be. And let's just say you could have the Grand Canyon between some of those opinions. So this is not boding well. I have a feeling we're going to be struggling a little bit during this COP to really come out with something that will be a clear sense of this global stock take. And importantly, how, how on earth should this global stock take inform new pledges in two years? What mechanism is there for countries to actually remember what the heck happened and then use that in their next pledges? Because the Paris Agreement is silent on that as well. And this really gets to the challenge of the Paris Agreement and climate policy in general is the dance between collective and individual country and those countries who would like, of course, to avoid having fingers point at them, opt for the collective. But it does raise a question, does the global stock take its scope, I would think, includes not just emissions, but does it also include progress towards adaptation and climate finance? Yes, it is pretty much all areas of climate. So it is mitigation, reducing emissions, it's building resilience through adaptation, it's finance, technology, capacity building, it's running the gamut. That's going to be quite an output. The next three issues I'd like to work through touch on those three, at least what I see as the three main pillars of the Paris Agreement being emissions, adaptation, and finance. On the emissions front, one can, of course, look global emissions. This, this is often easier because it's a number and you can add it up and you can say, well, how many gigatons of carbon were released? Is that on track? What's our estimate of the budget remaining for 1.5 or 2 degrees warming to the best of our knowledge? And that's much of, for example, what the UN Environment Program Emissions Gap Report touches on. I want to dive into one specific aspect of the emissions debate at the COPS. And this is the fossil fuel phase out that's been floated as an ambitious subset of emissions. Of course, there's more emissions than just carbon dioxide, and there's more carbon dioxide emissions other than fossil fuels, but fossil fuels constitute a large share of greenhouse gases. Where did the idea of a fossil fuel phase out originate, and where does it stand now? This is a fun story, actually. Cast your mind back to Glasgow. COP26. And for the first time ever, there was an agreed call for a phase down of unabated coal. Now, that language has been floating around the G20 for a while. And so it wasn't anything earth shattering, other than it was the first time that the UN climate change process has actually mentioned coal and fossil fuels. So it was all very surprising. And a lot of people welcomed this. And then the next year, a few countries that really rely on coal, for example, India, didn't really want to see this language start to spread. And so they started looking at developing or developed countries, sorry, and saying, well, wait, you've moved off coal as part of your you know, industrialization process, and now you use other fossil fuels, but we need coal as part of our industrialization process. So you want to take away what we need, but you're not promising to reduce your reliance on other fossil fuels. So there became sort of this tit for tat kind of dynamic happening. And so India said, why don't we phase down all fossil fuels as a, a little bit of a gameplay negotiation tactic 
but also pointing out the equity issues here of the industrialized world saying, sorry, you can't do what we did. So that's kind of where the idea started. And then the High Ambition Coalition, which is made up of the US and EU and some small island states, said, oh, okay. <laughs> so they took it up as this very progressive call for phasing down all fossil fuels. But I have to admit, one of the saddest or most frustrating moments I've ever had at a climate cop, and I think I have 10 or 11 under my belt now, was about six o'clock in the morning in Sharm El Sheikh after an all-nighter, where Alok Sharma from the UK was calling for a phase down of all fossil fuels at the same time as the UK was in the process of approving a new coal mine. And so that, I mean, maybe it gives a sense of, of how much weight I personally give to this call to phase down all fossil fuels, because there's also a report called the Production Gap Report that shows that countries and the same countries that are calling for this phase down are heavily investing and increasing their investments in fossil fuels. So yes, it's interesting and it could be symbolically or normatively, I guess, important, but I'm not sure this is going to move markets. And there's also notably a lot of wiggle words, if you will, in the language. You look back at the decision at Glasgow, and it talks about accelerating efforts toward the phase down of unabated coal power. So it's like, okay, well, we're going to accelerate our effort, not necessarily achieve anything. We're not going to phase out. We're going to phase down in its unabated use which could be interpreted a number of different ways. It can mean reckless or too fast or inefficient. I've heard one interpretation that it is the use of fossil fuels, in this case coal, where the, the CO2 that's being released is not captured and stored in some way. And it could mean all these things to, to different people. There's this creative amb ambiguity. What sort of language might we expect to be discussed at COP28? Where might this come out? How assertive might the language end up? Just if you could give a range, not necessarily a prediction. I think I've seen some countries, and notably, I think the American position here would be important. A lot of those wiggle words first came up in a bilateral agreement between China and the US. And then India added a few more about the context of equity and sustainable development. So the American position here is one to watch. And I think the American position is sitting somewhere around a phase down of unabated fossil fuel. Now, I think you could probably expect to see a few more wiggle words around whether that's production, whether that's use, whether that's you know installation of new, that kind of thing. But I think the unabated word is, you said creatively amb ambiguous. I think it's also constructively ambiguous because it allows people to agree, even though they don't know what they're necessarily agreeing to. I want to take a step back to that emission gap. Can you give us a sense of how big a gap there is at the moment between the Paris goals of well below two and ideally below one and a half or whatever the exact phrasing is, and, and where emissions have gone and where they're likely to go by 2030? I think the current estimates, and I'm saying this knowing that the next UNEP emissions gap report is probably going to come out in about a week. So I'll be wrong very soon. But I think the estimates are that even if all of the pledges that we have to the Paris Agreement are fully implemented, we're still looking at 2.5 to 2.8, maybe as high as 3.2 degrees. And that's if countries have done absolutely everything they said. So the gap's pretty big and really shows that we have to start thinking about this ratcheting up of which the global stock take is a huge part of it. How do we ratchet up efforts to reduce our emissions very quickly? Yeah, so I guess another thing on the agenda is to form a global goal on adaptation. Is that right? What are the challenges there and where do things stand? Yeah, it's an interesting one. So the Paris Agreement has a global goal on adaptation. So we have one already. It's a bit broad because if you think of adaptation, it means something different almost community to community, street by street. So one community, I'm in Wales. So if you look at Aberystwyth, they really need to think about sea level rise, as does Cardiff. But you go inland a little bit and they're worried about droughts. So it's going to be a different picture of what has to happen on adaptation. And it's highly contextualized. And in a lot of cases, it's quite qualitative. So the goal and the work in the last couple of years has been, 
How do we operationalize this goal? How do we understand adaptation in a global context when it's also a very local problem? And how do we get a sense of where we're actually at with it, given all of the qualitative and contextual factors? So that's supposed to be done this year. But the purpose is largely to help keep adaptation on the agenda because everyone is talking about the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement and everyone is ignoring the adaptation goals of the Paris Agreement. And so part of it is to make sure that this goal has enough political traction and that countries can start to really leverage the other financial goals and leverage some of the other efforts towards and supporting adaptation. How do you measure progress towards adaptation? We will find out when they finish their work this year. <laughs> it's, it's very, very tricky. Some have proposed sort of thinking about it almost sectorally, you know, in terms of what adaptation or sorry, agriculture is doing, or maybe looking at in terms of water, drought, those kinds of challenges. Some are thinking go country by country in terms of what the needs of that country might be. It's very, very tricky. And it's not like emissions where we can cast back and quantify. Adaptation by definition, in a lot of cases, is a forward-looking exercise. What do we expect to see given the emissions that we expect or that we think we've already pumped up into the atmosphere? And so it's a planning exercise as much as anything else, which almost reverses the logic in a way that, that we're looking forward to plan as opposed to looking backwards and trying to figure out where we can reduce emissions. I guess um, it's kind of anticipating Jesse's next point, but one way to do it be sort of measuring the financial needs. If you need, I don't know, a trillion dollars to, to get such and such to be ready for climate change, is that the kind of way we might measure it? It seems hard otherwise to find kind of a unifying metric. Yeah, I have a feeling they won't come up with just one metric. I think there will be a series. Yeah, there was a report before COP26. It was the first ever report on the needs of developing countries. And it put the figure in the trillions. And a lot of that was for adaptation. But one of the big caveats around this is that the countries that are most vulnerable to climate change tend to also have the least capacity to assess their needs. They maybe don't have the models that say exactly what's going to happen in the next 10, 15, 50 years to various sectors of their economy. And so without some of those anticipatory tools, then it's really hard to say, here's what we have to do, here's what it probably costs. So it's sort of this vicious circle in a way of a lack of capacity means that you maybe underestimate or don't estimate the right things. And then you get the things you asked for, but that doesn't improve your capacity. So around and around we go. How does, how does economic development feature in here? Because it's kind of, I mean, it seems quite obvious looking across the world that highly developed countries are also fairly robust to whatever the world can throw at them, whereas very poor countries are obviously very vulnerable. How does development feature in discussions of adaptation? Yeah, it's, it's a good question because it shows how complicated adaptation is. It's not just about a natural ecosystem's physical capacity to adapt to a changing climate. It's also about socioeconomic and socioecological adaptation. To what extent can a community adapt if they have to change crops or if pests start to move to now warmer climates or if there's different invasive species? What's the ability of a community to adapt? And that's been shown to have huge divides in terms of economic income, in terms of gender. So, for example, women are often not taught how to swim. And that really matters when there's floods and ever-increasing storms. So if you look at fatalities after a superstorm, there's a huge gender divide there where women tend to pass away and be victims of those storms far more than men. There's also racial disparities. So indigenous peoples, for example, that don't have secure land tenure. So without secure land tenure, it's really hard to say we're going to implement this adaptation project because that could all just be wiped away. So there's all of these layers of social and economic and ecological resiliences or vulnerabilities that make it even harder to try to get a global sense of adaptation. Heat indeed warmed me up for this next question, and this is around money. Of course, rhetoric is, is in abundance in such negotiations. 
And as with so many things in life, financial resources can be a bottleneck. So over the years, this concept of climate finance has emerged. And it is a fairly broad concept, generally means money moving from rich countries that are relatively resilient to climate, moving to countries that are more and relatively vulnerable to climate change. And this can be public or private money, so money from governments or investments, and it can be for purposes of cutting emissions or for adaptation. And this is over the, since the last, oh, I don't know, about 15 years, this has really emerged as a top level issue with one number in particular looming over these conversations. Jen, can you give a little bit of background to the current conversations about climate finance? Sure. I mean, I would put this back to the very beginning in the early 90s, really, when they were negotiating the Climate Change Convention, because a big part of it, and here's a fun fact in case there's ever any climate trivia at a pub, the Climate Treaty is the only one that sits under the UN General Assembly. The others are under the Environment Program, mostly. So it's the only General Assembly Environment Treaty that we have. And this is because at the very beginning, a bunch of countries realized this is going to be at the heart of our economic development. So they wanted to make sure that it was under the General Assembly and under the Secretary General, especially. So economic implications were recognized very quickly. And there's been a financial mechanism since the very beginning, since 1992. And then the conversation really started to increase when there were increasing calls for developing countries to start reducing their own emissions. And when it became clear that adaptation is here and now. So in the mid 2000s, when no longer were we talking about climate change as this far away thing that in the future will have some kind of impact, but the IPCC could say, no, it's here, it's now, this is what's happening. And so that's really when climate finance calls to ramp up started. Now, I think the magic number you're referring to is 100 billion. So 100 billion. So in 2011, sorry, in 2011, maybe 2010, developed countries said, we promise to provide $100 billion a year for climate finance by 2020. And then despite all sorts of calls for a roadmap or progress reports, nothing really happened. And we're still kind of sitting about 86. I've heard rumors that maybe they'll meet it this year. But the OECD has yet to confirm that. So we're not sure that we meet it. This lack of delivery has honestly hurt trust amongst countries more than anything else I've ever seen. Countries no longer, especially developing countries, no longer think that anything that the developed countries say is actually going to happen. And so, you know, we're currently negotiating a new climate finance goal under the Paris Agreement. The number has to be set by 2025. And there's calls for China and India and Saudi Arabia to all contribute to that fund. And they're saying, but you haven't actually delivered on the promises that you met at all. So why would we be putting into this pot when developed countries are not coming through? So it's, it's contentious and it's thorny and it's, you know, those negotiators spent all day in a room together, moving from finance topic to finance topic. Finance is the biggest area of the agenda now. And yeah, by the end, they sort of like each other, but not really. So it's it's a really tricky area now, just where there's zero trust amongst countries, which makes negotiations very, very difficult. This is a topic that really highlights an aspect of international climate change politics that I think outside observers underappreciate, which is just how sharp the differences are in perspective from relatively rich countries, which have greater historical contribution to climate change and remain, certainly at a per capita basis, larger ongoing contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. Yet, both because they're rich and because they're at, in colder climates, they're more protected to climate change. And the poor countries who are lower latitude, uh, still developing. And it came up in the topic earlier, you mentioned India and coal, that it's very understandable that developing countries were concerned that climate change would be a mechanism by which they were kept poor. Oh, you need to cut back on fossil fuel use, which is essential to economic development, which is so happens to be where so many countries are poised to go up the curve. And meanwhile, the rich countries were concerned that it would be an issue to extract financial resources from them to go to the global south under perhaps claims of liability and responsibility. 
Which brings me to my next topic, which is loss and damage, which is a very contentious topic because it hints at responsibility and financial transfers related to that. Jen, can you tell us what loss and damage is and maybe what it isn't and the status of negotiations around a loss and damage mechanism? Well, I'll take a go. Loss and damage, really we're talking about permanent climate effects. So, or we need to adapt when emissions go up. But then when adaptation fails or some effects are beyond what can be adapted to, think about ever increasing strength of storms that, you know, at some point we can't build a levee high enough or we can't build buildings in certain areas. Well, that's a permanent loss for that community. So there's limits to adaptation now. And so when we hit those limits, then we get permanent effects that are called losses and damages. It's a very broad area. There's rapid onset, there's slow onset. You can think of sea level rise as the classic slow onset loss and damage issue because you can't really adapt to your island nation disappearing under the water. It's definitely beyond adaptation. So that's where we're at with this loss and damage. And so liability comes into this. There's some other areas of work, like early warning systems, how to think about climate refugees. So there are areas of work already under something called the Warsaw International Mechanism. It's been going for 10 years. But last year, and this is why I never guess on the outcomes of COPS, because I would have got this wrong, was an agreement to establish a fund for loss and damage. So although some countries are now saying funding arrangements, and I'm not sure of the the significance of that, but it's something to watch what comes out of that because different countries are holding on to different words there. So this fund, we're not really sure what it's going to do yet. So all they agreed to last year was to establish it. And then there's been a committee, so a small group that's been trying to work out the specific. What is the scope of this versus, say, humanitarian assistance after a flood or after a natural disaster? What other options are there? What kind of funding can be provided? Who's eligible? Who's going to make decisions on this board of this fund? And so they've been asking all those questions. Who's going to host it? You know, can we just have the World Bank do it? And so far that group has met five times and I don't think they've reached agreement. So remember when I said 195 countries have to do this? About 28 countries just failed. So uh, this is another one of my, we're going to be up all night on this one type of issues. So there's a lot of concerns because some countries, especially maybe say the US, are very worried that this is going to imply liability. It doesn't necessarily have to. It could be insurance schemes. But yeah, that slippery slope has some countries very, very worried. And it's for that reason that, if my memory is correct, the COP decision at Paris, so this was issued along with the Paris Agreement back in COP 21 in 2015, the decision there explicitly says anything that we call loss and damage is not liability. And the idea seems to me to be to provide some form of compensation to help those who have been harmed without necessarily connecting it with those countries who have contributed. But it does raise some very difficult questions to extend what I said a moment ago about rich and poor countries. Because back in 1992, when the UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, was negotiated, there was a pretty clear division between industrialized countries of the so-called first and second world, as they were still called in the 80s at least, and the poor countries of the third world. You You map them out by per capita GDP, and there's two peaks, if you will, in the distribution. And so the UNFCCC of 1992 has this list. These are the rich countries. These are the poor countries. And it's it's binary. Since then, one of the best developments of the last few decades have been poor countries are becoming less poor, some more rapidly than others. And now there's a continuum. And of course, the elephant in the room here is China, which has been the largest total emitter of annual greenhouse gas emissions, remember, right, about 10 years or so. And even at a per capita level, you can say, well, yeah, China has is the most populous country, but at a per capita level, it is now greater than the European Union. Where does China fit into this loss and damage equation? Are they going to be a contributor to the fund? 
because of course they would rather not. They're clinging on as desperately as possible to this mantle of being a developing country. Would they be a recipient of international funds or neither? And this is exactly the trick. So we're negotiating a lot of finance stuff right now. And this question of who contributes, usually the jargon thrown around is expanding the donor pool to make it sound very, you know, technical, not political kind of thing. This is coming up in several finance conversations. And I think it makes some sense, maybe in the context of the new quantified goal. So the new Paris Agreement goal on finance, how much they'll try to mobilize. Because China actually does provide a lot of climate finance, but they don't do it through the UN process. Because as you said, they're a developing country and they want to ensure that it's developed countries that provide the finance to developing countries. But still, China provides climate finance through bilateral agreements, through other initiatives. And so the climate finance space is extremely complicated. Actually, far more happens outside the UN process than within it. So in the context of a new goal, perhaps expanding the donor pool to just recognize reality makes sense. For loss and damage fund, though, equity is at the middle of this. And so asking China to help pay for loss and damage that was caused by historic emissions is a very different question. From what I've heard from this committee that's been meeting over the last year, there have been calls to expand the donor pool that have been met with absolute no's by a very sort of clearly organized and there's a lot of solidarity amongst the G77, the developing countries, which they rarely agree. So G77 is really only solidly unified on loss and damage and on agriculture in the climate world. And There's no sign of that changing, despite maybe efforts. So after the Paris Agreement was signed, or at the same time, I believe the Earth, the IPCC, to publish their report on 1.5 Celsius, the difference that that would make. And I believe it was around that time that the scientists made it pretty clear, and it's been sort of confirmed since, that to get temperatures back down to 1.5 Celsius, or even to meet that goal within the century, you need carbon dioxide removal. Has that, well, scientific statement, has that kind of followed through into the COP negotiations? And where does CDR stand in those? Nope and nope. Uh, There's very little mention in the core of the negotiations about carbon dioxide removal, carbon capture and storage, really very, very little. So that could be interpreted a couple ways. One, that it's sort of a slippery slope. You know, some carbon dioxide removal options are quite clearly carbon dioxide removal, and others maybe by some are seen as geoengineering and tinkering. And so some wonder that maybe the UN process for climate change, maybe we actually need like a different process for that. And so the other way to read it is that the Paris Agreement is leaving it up to countries to do it. If they would choose that option, they can choose that option. If they don't want to choose that option, they don't have to. But yeah, it's one of those issues where the UN process has been historically silent. Now, I don't expect this one to make it onto the agenda at all, solar radiation management. But how much do you think that will be discussed on the sidelines of this meeting? Yeah, that's the only place where a lot of these conversations happen, actually. There's usually some side events on it, so it'll come up. I don't know if it will be, in terms of just one specific technology or group of technologies, if it will be really a headline issue. I think we'll hear more about CDR technologies moving forward, but all on the sidelines probably of the negotiations. Well, and then that brings up those sidelines. You mentioned, I think it's the the number of people attending is going to be 70,000 this time. So these are really, really quite gigantic go to these American Geophysical Union conferences, and I think they get up to 20,000. And that's a hell of a lot of people. (laughs) 70,000 is obviously a lot more. What's going on on these sidelines? And how much value does that add? I mean, these are huge. And just to kind of quickly give you a sense of how huge, from security, and it's an airport style security, that to my office is generally a kilometer. So you get your steps in at least. But these meetings are so big now that actually a lot of countries that would love to host can't. I'm sure that there's a lot of small island states that would love to put their issues first and foremost, and there's no way that we could get this many people there. Glasgow, they invited 40,000 people during a pandemic. The venue only held 15,000, so there were three-hour-long queues in Glasgow in November. People were not happy. So yeah, giant, absolutely giant meetings. 
because a lot of this is being driven by increased participation by business, by civil society, by other international organizations, and by the media. And I should also say by this new habit we have of inviting presidents and prime ministers and their entourages. That never used to happen. So before Paris, we only had heads of state go to in 2009, and they made a big mess of everything. But since Paris, every presidency has decided, oh, we need high-level speeches from leaders all over the place. And of course, prime ministers don't travel alone. They bring a whole bunch of people with them. They arrive on day one, give a speech on day two, and fly out on day three. So if I was ever asked on how to slim down a cop, that might be my first area to uh, ax. But I think a lot of this, in terms of civil society participation, is being driven by two things. One is a broader idea of what climate change is and all the effects of climate change. So some of my work has looked at the diversification of the civil society presence, as more people now are there from unions or women's rights organizations or climate justice organizations, indigenous peoples. It's no longer just the Climate Action Network and a few businesses and, you know, the usual folks. So a lot of it's being driven by this increased social movements that are involved. But also, I think the climate COP has become a stand-in for all environmental issues. So a lot of businesses are there talking about water alongside their climate promises. And this mobilization of businesses was something that was aimed at kind of helping get the Paris Agreement by showing, well, if all these businesses are doing this, then of course countries have to sign up too. So as a way to sort of subtly pressure governments to agree, well, that's now taken on a life of its own since 2015. And we're seeing more and more businesses show up talking about all of their environmental issues, not just climate change. So I think this is really becoming a stand in for the whole sustainable development agenda rather than a conversation about climate change, which is frankly big enough on its own already. Does all this extra activity help the main negotiations or are they really quite separate? It's amazing how little those two spaces, three, four spaces speak to each other. So you have the negotiations going on and some of that for security purposes, especially when prime ministers and presidents are there, are quite hard to get into. But yeah, you have the main technical, boring sometimes negotiations happening. Then you have the exciting businesses, global climate action hub space. Then you have the exhibitions and side events happening. Then so usually in another building, uh, you have the green zone where it's easier to get into and sometimes public where even more events are happening. And so some of them are physically blocked off from each other, but very rarely do you see cross-fertilization of ideas, especially now because negotiators are too busy to go to those extra events or even people talking about what's latest happening in the negotiations in their side events. They really are almost separate worlds. So would all this benefit by doubling in size again, or has this current sort of approach to COPs kind of outgrown its usefulness? Yeah, that's a real conversation that's happening now, because this growth trend is just getting a bit out of hand. Every COP apparently has to be bigger than the last one. Why? I'm not really sure. There's been a lot of talk about COP reform lately. Some are saying maybe do this every two years instead of every year. A few of us have put forward ideas about splitting the COP essentially in half, maybe in three. So have the negotiations kind of pared down, slim, settled. Maybe they'll be in Bonn every year where the secretariat is. And then you could have your high-level speeches you know, somewhere if, if all the leaders want to physically get together. And then you could have all the global climate action stuff maybe happen in the presidency's country, because you don't necessarily need all of these people in one place. And I think we're in a state of diminishing returns here on the investment that it takes. It's not cheap to go to COP, but everybody feels the need to be there. I think there's, there's a lot of FOMO happening when it comes to climate COPs. I was trying to zoom right out, take a big step back. It seemed like the Paris Agreement was a move to pragmatism. We're legally binding, but only insofar as we're going to tell each other what we're going to do. In this sort of post-Paris world, can we expect any dramatic changes in ambition or in direction for climate change from now on? Are we now just only going to see incremental change? It's a really tough question. And 
and those pair screaming five yearly cycles are central to it. So we'll really only know if we get a big step forward in two years, which is already confirmed to be in Brazil, COP30. The next COP's a bit trickier, but those big jumps are only maybe going to happen every five years, which is really difficult knowing what we now know about probably hitting 1.5 degrees before the end of this decade. So we have one more NDC cycle to get this right. That's really tricky. And I think the central kind of zoomed out tension point here is, is it going to be markets that do this before governments? Or are governments going to send the signal that get the markets moving? Because we know renewables have never been cheaper. We know the installation of renewable capacity is now outstripping that of fossil fuels. The, the International Energy Agency released a report just last week that claims that we are going to hit peak oil demand before 2030. So are markets going to do this while governments are dithering about trying to figure out what to put in their next pledge? And if that's the world we're in, things could move very quickly, but they won't move very justly. So we're going to see a lot of people out of work. We're going to see people displaced. And we're going to see a complete lack of attention to adaptation and to loss and damage. So there's a huge role for governments here that we need more than incremental change. And it looks increasingly like they're going to have to keep up with what's happening in the markets. Looking back on all these COPs, 27 so far, 28 coming up, how instrumental have they been in steering this direction? Correlation is not causation. The emissions curve has been bending in the general direction we wanted. It's less than the forecast of decades ago, and expected global warming from that is consequently decreasing. But is all this talk resulting in hundreds of, if not thousands, yes, thousands of person hours spent in these late night negotiations around whether it's a comma or a semicolon, are these helping? Or is this theater for politicians who can look like they're doing something? I would say it is both. It is certainly, you know, we have more and more treaties, and yet the environment continues to get worse. And that's across the board, really, if you're looking at pollution or climate or water, or oceans, biodiversity, certainly. There's a lot of theater. Like I said, I don't really think the world leaders need to be there. One thing they proved during COVID is they are very good at giving speeches to an online audience. There's also a lot of sort of theater just in the negotiations themselves. A lot of, I mean, frankly, gamesmanship that you can't give on this one area of negotiations, even if it's completely pointless, because that might set a precedent in an area of the negotiations that a country really cares about. So we have wasted a lot of hours talking about the website that makes all of the NDCs public. I mean, just heart-wrenchingly depressing how much time we wasted on that. But I think that there are a few things that we need COP for. One is to set the global direction. So even if some of this is rhetoric and performance, investors look at it and they realize that everyone's talking about 1.5, not 2. So it sets normative direction that markets can respond to. And the second thing I think it does is it gives a platform for climate vulnerable countries. There's been a lot of talk about climate minilateralism, where essentially you get the G20 together, they represent 80% of emissions or more, get them to fix it. They can talk amongst themselves. There's only 20 of them. Should be easier with 20. They can figure it out on a sector by sector basis, reduce some emissions. That leaves out all of the countries that are going to be hurt and that are already hurting from climate change. So all of the low lying island states are not in the G20. So, so climate change is one of those things that ties the human family together in a really unique way where those who are causing problems are not those that are most affected by them. And so we need COP to get loss and damage on the agenda, to keep pushing for adaptation and adaptation finance, and to keep raising all of these issues in the context of we still need to be reducing emissions rapidly. It's clear that slogging through late nights at COP with such positive progress, but modest, can be depressing or off-putting. Merely discussing it here might have that effect. What things bring you optimism in this world? See, this this is running joke with my students that I try not to depress them every week and I fail most. But there are positives. There are positives that we're increasingly recognizing the permanent and temporary effects of climate change. You know, we talked about loss and damage in the context of developing countries, but 
it's here. It's in the UK. It's in Canada. You know, where I'm from in northern Canada had a record wildfire season. Sorry, I know you asked for positive. I'm getting there. But I take heart in that we don't have to start from, is this climate change? It's more in the context of climate change, here's what's happening. And so now there's conversations about how do we move forward and how do we move forward quickly? And that's, you know, maybe sounds like a small step, but it starts from a step of action. And so I think there's optimism there. I think there's also optimism in the fact that renewables are just the business case. You know, why on earth would you open a new coal plant these days? And the increasing pressure for that. So there's growing consensus and there's growing direction about what to do. And increasingly, it makes economic sense to do the climate friendly thing. Are we moving fast enough? No, absolutely not. But there is movement in the right direction. So I try to remember that every time I read everything depressing about climate change as well. And I think there's a lot of hope in that a lot of the solutions are coming from communities and bottom up. It's hard to connect all those dots into a big systemic change that we need, but it means that we can start looking towards local solutions that that will have a difference over time and that can create models that could potentially be used somewhere else. Our guest today has been Dr. Jennifer Allen of the Earth Negotiations Bulletin and Cardiff University. Jen, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Well, thanks for listening. Please rate or review us on Apple Podcasts and elsewhere and consider supporting us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash challengingclimate.